Arsenal Football Club. One of the most historic and successful clubs in Europe needed a new home. Arsenal's problem in the, uh, in the 1990 was that post the Taylor report on, uh, on safety in sports grounds, their capacity had been cut from well over 50,000 down to 38,000. And that's despite the building of two new stands in the east and the west. And their, their corporate facilities were falling behind some of the other major clubs. Um, so they, they, they wanted a new stadium with a greater capacity, up to 60,000, and you know, the best corporate facilities possible. And as a club, they, they had a reputation for doing things properly. The hybrid ground was quite an iconic football ground, and, and they wanted a world-class stadium. To remain one of the acknowledged top four in the English Premiership, a significant increase in size was required and the club were not just looking at increased revenue from ticket sales. A larger stadium could mean increasing sales across many different revenue streams. Well we had a very, um, very open brief. The club hadn't really attempted anything like this before so they weren't dictating any particular method of working or, or role or brief for us. And we formed a steering group with about uh, seven or eight of the key people, and consultants and clients involved with the job from pretty much the outset in March, April of 2000. And we managed that group and that, that really was the springboard for, for how the project started. A major issue for the board of directors was to gain acceptance from the fans for a move from a much loved home. This would be greatly helped by keeping Arsenal in North London. Not an easy task, finding enough land to host the footprint of a massive new stadium and the associated increase in traffic to and fro. Amazingly, the Arsenal directors managed to find a site only a few hundred yards from Highbury, but it was far from deserted. We very, very quickly realised that the project was, was broken into three fundamental parts, uh, a new stadium, a relocation site at Loft Road where we would have to provide a lot of the facilities that were on the Ashburton Grove site and then the final phase was, um, was Highbury Square. Ashburton Grove is roughly a triangle. To the west and the east are mainline railway lines and to the south a small industrial estate. In the centre lay a council owned recycling unit and this would need to be recited at cost to the club as would the acquiring of the industrial units. And the, the rest of the, the project included the, the very substantial relocations of the North London Waste Authority's waste transfer station, councils, depot, their, their building maintenance department and then there were a myriad of other occupiers on the site who all had to be relocated and their site purchased or just a straight site purchase and that, that actually became uh, the major focus of the first um, three years of the project. The entirety of the site included land beyond the boundaries of the railway lines and beyond the southern road and whilst this extra land could all be used the stadium footprint would have to be within those boundaries. A key decision was taken to appoint a builder during the design process not always the case in such projects and a decision which in retrospect was fundamental to the outstanding success of the project. Um, well we had a very interesting shortlisting. We, we started with about six companies um, who we thought might be capable of building the new stadium. Really at interview two of three of those companies didn't really fit the bill and then McAlpine were, were the most memorable really at interview Rolf Christensen very much came across as somebody who wasn't in any way or shape concerned about the magnitude of the project, wasn't overwhelmed by the project and was very confident and even you know relished the the deadline nature of, of building stadiums and having them open for the beginning of, of, of football seasons. An obvious but crucial design decision was choosing the distinctive shape of the stadium. A more conventional rectangular design was discounted as it was too wasteful of much needed land and in the end it came down to simple geometry in that the elliptical shape fitted snugly into the triangular nature of the site squeezing every inch from the available space. 
and we were all new to it, so we all sat down and discussed every part of it, what was required, and they had held their own at stadiums all over Europe, perhaps the world, and that they had an idea of what they wanted, and we together, the Royal V, we, we all worked very hard to what they wanted for us to get it on a piece of paper and get the engineering right and that was a real challenge and the time we spent the six months pre-construction without it I think that we would have had a few problems and we avoided problems and basically the construction went like a clockwork and we completed it within time and even had it over earlier so it went well. To gain planning consent the club would need to demonstrate that 60,000 fans could come and go to the ground with as little negative impact to the local community as possible, preferably using public transport. Two massive bridges were designed on the east of the site spanning the railway line, taking fans to both underground and above ground stations. Another obstacle was the recycling unit at the site's very centre. This would have to remain very much in operation through the early part of the build, whilst a new unit in Luff Road was constructed. Positives to the community were needed, in addition to a new recycling unit, and it was determined that the stadium would generate much more than simply a new football ground. Areas within the site would contain affordable housing and give the companies on the industrial estate chance of resettling into new premises. What was known at this stage as simply Ashburton Grove would be a much needed and major regeneration of the area. With designs finalised and consents gained some two and a half thousand signed documents later saw demolition teams move into Ashburton Grove in February 2003 and McAlpine site teams settling into their new offices. Again, having designers, engineers and management on site was an important ingredient in the project's success. Just as things were starting to happen, it all ground to a halt. It was about end of March of 2003. We'd been through without doubt the toughest year on the project and we'd been going through all of the contract negotiations with McAlpine and the funding with the banks and we finally had virtually every one of our ducks in a row both myself and the client separately went off on holiday at the end of March and when I got back a week or so later I went in to see him and he gently dropped the bombshell that one of the banks had pulled out and that the funding wasn't now possible for the stadium. Work stopped and the site was mothballed though Sir Robert McAlpine's used this pause in construction to continue design development and progressing the Luff Road Waste and Recycling Centre. Uh, today is an historic day in the life of Arsenal Football Club. I'm delighted to be able to announce that the funding has been secured for our new stadium project. By the time the funding came in, that was four years on the project and uh, I think everyone had put so much into it then that the thought of it not proceeding was, was awful so it was, there were some, there was some pretty, pretty major celebrations at the end of February when the, the banks finally signed up. With the funding now in place McAlpine's resumed work immediately and with some haste. If milestones along the critical path were not met at this early stage then it might have significant impact later in the project and railway possessions and such like had been booked well before there was a hiccup in the funding. If the Arsenal board hadn't have funded the continued fabrication of the bridge components and if it wasn't for the speed in which McAlpine's resumed construction then there could well have been delays. But within a matter of weeks the stadium started to take shape and the practicalities of the construction programming became evident with one end of the stadium apparently racing ahead. Of course, this was far from the case. Crucially, the bridge's construction had to be on time. Their assembly site actually fell into the path of the stadium, so they needed to be built and moved into place so not to delay construction to the south end of the stadium. Because of the constrained nature of the site, 
the construction program was to commence the northern parts of the stadium first, leaving space for the bridge construction, the continued use of the recycling unit, and afterwards programming the construction of the lower terracing in the south stand to create enough space for the roof truss assembly. Any delay to either the bridges or the roof would delay the fundamental stadium structure. We were knocking the buildings down as they were being vacated, or in the first instance having the services isolated. Building vacated, um, demolish, remediation and then piling. And subsequently following on as closely as we could behind the piling with the, the substructure. So you, you have a fine balance all the time in terms of trying to do one operation as close as you can to the next without losing efficiency in one or other of the operations. Because of the unusual nature of the site, roughly a triangle surrounded by railway lines on two sides, one of the key aspects of the design were for two bridges to be constructed on the northeast and southeast of the site. To get the crowd away, we built two bridges across the railway line, and they are massive bridges. I mean, one is 25, 26 meter wide, and the other is 18 meter wide. It is two massive bridges just to take the crowd and spread the crowd. And I mean, it had been a few disasters with football stadiums and crowd and one thing and another. And all this in the design was taken into consideration. People can escape all over the place. Because the stadium structure would fill a huge percentage of the total site available, elements of these bridges would need to be built and completed before the stadium structure was in place. The other intricacy with the site was the extent of the works that we had to build on the site which weren't necessarily related to the, the arena. And the two bridges are good examples of they were assembled in the plan of the stadium and thereby occupied space that we needed to free up to build the stands. The South Bridge in particular sat in the middle of the southwest of the, of the stadium and was built as a whole 100 metre section bridge and then slid across. So obviously until that bridge was located over, to the, over the railway line, slid into place, that section of the stadium couldn't be built. The same went for the North Bridge up in the northeast corner whereby Elements of that were built on the site of the stadium and it needed to be positioned and dependency there was with getting rail track possessions to install the bridge. So quite high levels of risk in terms of third party approvals and the consequence of not getting the bridge in place was that we had a critical path delay in the, the stadium. The North Bridge was the first to be completed and was built on site from pre-produced sections. The construction team always knew that their positioning on time would be critical to the completion date and when the funding hiccup in 2003 took place the good relationship between constructor and client proved crucial. And then you consider that we booked that um, possession 36-38 weeks prior with the uh, rail track. So that weekend it had to be ready and to give an example how committed Arsenal were, it, that was on the critical path and then the uh, construction was stopped in April 2003 because they didn't get the funding and obviously it was a long leading for material. Arsenal with their own money funded the uh, procurement, all the material, the steel and also the fabrication. So whenever they got the funding 1st of April we were ready to go and we managed to get it across in I don't know, 16 hours, 15 hours in the middle of August and that was a critical part because we couldn't co construct the east stand so that was an achievement and everybody put together and it worked out great. With roads and railway lines closed the North Bridge was ready to be lifted. Built in two halves of 180 tonnes each, each section was eased into place by massive 750 tonne cranes over two weekend possessions. The second, the salt bridge, was a different animal. I mean, it is 100 meter long and weighed 1,000 tonnes. And we basically couldn't get a big enough crane across or to lift it. So we had to build it inside the stadium, inside the um, east stand. And uh, we were then sliding it across. A Dutch specialist contractor oversaw this amazing technical operation. 
a heavily greased 1,000 tonne bridge was gently but steadily dragged across Drayton Park Station with amazing precision. The bridge's completion and their moving away from the actual stadium structure allowed the southeastern section of the stadium to be commenced and a major milestone on the critical path was completed on time. With the bridges in place and away from the stadium area, attention turned to the closing of the recycling unit. Away from the glare of publicity that Ashburton Grove was creating, across town in Luff Road, the landscape had changed and the new recycling unit was completed and opened. Built in isolation, this would have been considered a major project in any local community and was a tangible sign to the local population of the benefits the new stadium would bring. Now that demolition of the waste unit could commence, work could begin on the two southernmost cores and the area that would become a world-class football pitch could be cleared and levelled. On the 22nd of October 2004, the Arsenal directors made another important announcement. Construction of our new stadium has progressed at a fantastic rate, thanks to the great work by our stadium constructors, Sir Robert McAlpine. With the opening of our stadium in the summer of 2006 quickly approaching, we're delighted today to be announcing a significant partnership which will lead us into this new chapter in the history of Arsenal. This relationship is for both a naming rights partner for the new stadium and also a club sponsorship agreement, representing the biggest ever financial sponsorship deal in English football. So it is my honour to announce the beginning of the partnership between Arsenal Football Club and Emirates. Ashburton Grove was now to be known as the Emirates Stadium. A major sponsorship deal had been signed and any financial worries for the board started to seem a lifetime away. I mean, the other aspect of the stadium is that on the seven hectares footprint, the stadium covered the whole area. It was no spare land left at all. And also then you consider that I don't know, I have six or seven or eight hundred car parking spaces below. And that is helping everybody. And that is quite unusual that within the stadium you have the parking facilities. I mean, the stadium has a raised podium, so everything at the ground level is either car parking, changing room, and kitchen and storeroom and maintenance room. But all that had to be squeezed into the footprint on this triangle we had at the stadium. The northern end of the stadium raced on ahead of the southern end until both bridges and recycling units had moved. Then the southern cores could be built, but leaving out the southern prefabricated terracing units to allow space for the roof trusses to be swung into position. Only once the roof trusses were in position could the full stadium continue on to completion. The roof trusses had to be built in the same way as the bridges. Prefabricated components were shipped onto site, joined together in the future pitch area and then hoisted into position and bolted together. The roof was a real challenge. I mean, history we don't mention stadium have had problems with the roof and we obviously spent a lot of time together with Watson and Watson is as the engineering is very very good and they are tubular specialists and we have used them previously and we uh, spent a lot of time with them and the structural engineer Barra Happel and we just went through there how we are going to fabricate it, how we are going to erect it, and we simplified it, and it was decided originally we were going to lift it in one, this 220 meter long steel thrust, 800 ton, but then we decided to lift it in two half and prop it. And with this X model design they used, that meant every steel went up fitted. It had not had to be taken down or remade, etc. This X model in the design was definitely a a hell of a help for us and it worked out well. We, be, we were able to erect this, 
the roof steelwork in six months, and that includes all secondary steel. We fitted the secondary steelwork at site level, so that they went up, it was all fitted, and that reduced the program and also reduced the health and safety risk for people working up in the air. And it was all bolted together. It was no welding up at the top, but it went well. The obvious example would be the roof in terms of identifying how we were going to erect the primary and secondary trusses. In terms of the trusses being longer than the space available to sit them down in the middle of the pitch. To try and assemble a complete truss on the ground inside the um, stadium would mean that elements of that steel truss were sticking into the reinforced concrete structure and thereby fragmenting the ellipse. So a very early objective we set was trying to enable us to build a continuous ellipse, albeit with the lower tier front, lower tier left down. But by having a complete ellipse, it then allowed us to set commissioning zones and installation zones for the services and the fit out. Even with the programmed completion of the lower southern terracing, there simply wasn't enough space within the stadium pitch area to build the entire roof structure in one go. The northern end was built first and lifted in December 2004. Then the southern end built and lifted in the following April. The cranes were back. The sections were lifted onto four gigantic tripods in each corner of the stadium and supported at the midpoint on temporary trestles. The installation of the roof trusses freed up commencement of the lower terraces and in particular in the west stand where all the players change areas and referee change and so on there were quite a lot of rooms beneath those lower terraces and so they're with all the associated services and plumbing and showering and so on. It was critical to get out of the way to complete the frame. Finally, when all in place, Arsenal director Danny Fisman was lifted into position to place the ceremonial bolt joining the two roof halves together. With the roof trusses now in place, the future pitch was now clear and the race for completion was on. The inward sloping nature of the roof presented a number of challenges in terms of removing water from the internal perimeter and allowing sufficient sunlight onto the pitch to prevent the problems that other stadiums had of reduced sunlight affecting their playing surfaces. The roof is, a, is all in one piece and moves around therefore with temperature and wind um, and moves quite a lot and therefore the glazing that, that fits between the roof and the top of the concrete stands has, and is glass in steel frames has of course to articulate quite significantly in order to accommodate that movement. So it not only leans, but it leans inwards and outwards and side walk both ways. So getting that to go up looking as if it was right and have enough movement capability in it to accommodate what the movement that's going to hit when winter comes or summer comes, and we had some hot temperatures in the summer and some cold temperatures in the winter, was, um, was interesting. The stadium structure was now complete and another key milestone, the attainment of full height, was celebrated with a traditional topping out ceremony on the 15th of August 2005. A team of Arsenal directors played a team of Sir Robert McAlpine management and other project partners in the first game of football to be played at the Emirates Stadium. The major structure was now complete and the job of fitting out this enormous stadium was to begin. We've got 10 chillers with a, a capacity of about 5 megawatts of cooling capacity. We've got over 50 air handling units. Um, we've got about 40 catering establishments, whether it be kitchens, one large kitchen, a central processing unit, with about 16 kitchens and a 20 odd catering establishment. So, so it's, it's quite a large distribution system. When the stadium was designed and with the initial funding concerns, the interior of the stadium was designed as a basic fit. Piping in toilets would be exposed and block work would be more visible. As more investors came on board and with the Emirates sponsorship sealed, 
an upgrade in the fittings and fixtures was now possible. Then came a new challenge with the catering. And then the catering man pulled out. It was a problem. They didn't have anyone to fit out the kitchen and the concession. And they came in and said, what can you do? And together, or we did, I fitted out the kitchen and the concession. Over the course of the stadium build, over 300 changes were made to the original design. It's a testament to the relationship between client and constructor that most were agreed on a handshake and all were achieved within the agreed contract price. In the contract they said that we want the same quality pitch what they have at Highbury. Okay, Highbury is, is known to have had the best pitch in the Premier Division. The original design of the pitch had a set of sight lines which under UEFA conditions, who have a, a bigger advertising board, you, you lost sight lines on certain groups of seats and it, it, it had been laid out by the designers that this occurred. But as the job progressed we worked on trying to change the pitch levels to optimise sight lines relative to advertising boards. And as far as the advertising boards were concerned they introduced the um, electronic boards as a fairly late change which all has in trenches around the edge of the pitch, a fairly significant amount of servicing associated with them. So even the pitch was subject to change in development and, um, and again monopolised the, the level of achievement that there was in hitting dates. We, we never fell behind programmes so there was opportunity to carry out additional works, develop the, the design and improve it. The pitch at this moment after they have played 20 odd games is in fantastic condition according to, to the Arsenal board. The top two sides in the Premiership going directly to the group stage of the Champions League, Arsenal were lagging behind the top two. This would require them to play a qualifying match in early August, and the contracted date for completion was August the 1st. With ramp-up events needed prior to granting a safety certificate, the club had to ask McAlpines to try and finish early. I mean, it was vital that it was finished. I mean, what we allowed um, by working together in the last two months, they installed the IT and the telephone lines. All the furniture was being installed, the kitchen was being commissioned. We did over commissioning and uh, stagging and de stagging and suddenly we expected to have four or five hundred people on site for the last month. It was fifteen hundred people on site. And on top of that, training was going on with all the stewards. I mean, Arsenal has about a thousand stewards, and that was going on at the same time. And then it was this catering people also trained at three or four hundred people, and that was all in the last few weeks. So the last six to eight weeks was a little bit hectic, but everybody kept calm and worked together, and I think um, if we haven't had a good team spirit and a good trust between ourselves, it could have been two or three months delay. And basically we allowed them prior to practical completion to go in to do the training, to do their commissioning. And the reason for that, we were all in the same boat and had one object, that was to complete it on time or earlier. In the climate of delays to the new Wembley project, the Emirates team set a completion date in July and a first match of the 15th of July. It was to be Dennis Burkamp's testimonial, Arsenal versus Ajax. Ten, seven days or ten days after we got PC, they had 50,000 people in the stadium and played the testimonial for Burkamp. And Everything worked satisfactory, getting people, uh, spectators in and out, the IT, etc. And it was what the Arsenal director said afterwards. It's unbelievable. We have had 54,000 in and no snags at all. Seeing what 60,000 people look like, it's quite something to plan for 60,000 people, but realising that it's is between 600 and 1,000 trains on the tube. When you actually see them on the first day that you've got 60,000 people in the stadium, do you suddenly realise it's a whole new ball game? But for me, to see 54,000 people in, and it worked, it was the acid test, and I think that's what I would never forget. I think it was a model, pro model project in terms of it was a, 
it was a it was a fast project which we completed um, on on time. We obviously completed it within budget, both of which are huge ticks in the box for any potential client, and they're not easy things to deliver. My primary memory is coming over the South Bridge um, with my wife and two sons to the Burke Camp testimonial. That's the thing that will stick with me in terms of a lasting memory, I think, because it's sort of, in my mind, it, it was probably the first time it really dawned on me when ev everybody coming into the stadium, just what it was. So that would be my abiding memory. The people who are, whose project it is are HOK, who designed it, Arsenal, who had the vision for it, what I did was help to make it work. In, in my eyes it's a model, and I think for McAlpine it's a model project, that we managed to build something. Well, the team, except HOK's board, has not done before, and we did it. And again, it's a lesson there. If you apply simple engineering knowledge, you can do a lot.